man the poet Coleridge had envisioned in his mystic eye. It had to be the dark mirror. But how to use it? How to make it actually work, I asked myself. And then something that I had read the year before jogged my memory. Something about the use of dark mirrors in the Far East. The final clue had been sitting on my bookshelf all the time. The book was called Tantra, the Yoga of Sex by Omar Garrison. In this work, the author described an ancient oriental method of invoking the images of previous incarnations from the reflection of one's own face in a dark mirror. flanked by candles. As I reread this section in Garrison's book, I felt a shiver of excitement. I was experiencing the same thrill that an archaeologist must feel as he brushes away the sand and looks down at the unbroken seal of an ancient royal tomb. I tried Garrison's experiment, and I found that it worked with remarkable effectiveness. If one stares in a darkened room into a mirror flanked by candles, after several minutes, a strange phenomenon will almost always occur. The familiar reflection will fade out, the mirror will go black, and then when the image returns, it will be the face of someone or something else. This is any concept of reincarnation. It probably went back as far as the Paleolithic, when Stone Age people stared fascinated at their reflections in dark, still pools of water, seeing the strange transformation occur and being convinced that they were in the presence of their gods. I suspected that in a ritual setting using traditional conjurations and symbols, specific spirits and even ancient gods and goddesses might be summoned from the other side. This might well be the hidden meaning behind that strange passage in the Bible that reads, God fashioned man in his own image. I command the experience is usually accompanied by a profound sense of an otherworldly presence. It was obvious that this phenomenon must have been discovered a long time before and by the Tetragrammaton. Oh, by which the elements are overturned. The air is sundered, the fire is generated, the earth moves, the sea rolls back, and all those of things celestial, of things terrestrial, of things infernal, do tremble and are confounded together. Come, appear before this circle, within that triangle, in fair and human form, without horror or deformity and without delay. Come from whatever part of the world thou art and answer my questions. Come presently, come visibly, come affably and manifest that which I desire. Being summoned by the true and living God, Iliorum. I command thee by the particular king who rules over thee, the mighty Amaman, and by the power of the archangel Raphael, I command thee, appear before me, and speak unto me in a clear, intelligible voice in my mother tongue, free from ambiguity and guile. Come in the name of Adonai Zebaoth. Come, why dost thou tarry? Adonai Jedi, 
King of Kings commands thee. I've not been dead, but only sleeping. Hardly longer than a wink. I'll be up and rolling thunder once I have another drink. <laughs> After this discovery, the use of the magic mirror in an elevated triangle seemed obvious. This 17th century Lamegaton manuscript clearly shows a large black-filled circle in the center of Solomon's triangle. Notice that the instructions written around the triangle say two foot off from the circle and three foot over, not three foot across as the published version has it. The triangle was intended to be raised up to eye level. And this drawing from a 16th century manuscript by the mysterious Dr. Thomas Rudd shows a mirror on a stand with Solomon's secret seal from the Goetia of the Lamegaton clearly depicted on the reverse side, exactly like my original setup. We know that polished obsidian mirrors were used in the Neolithic Middle Eastern city of Katal Hayuk as far back as 9,000 years ago, before the Great Flood. And later, in the time of Solomon, the Egyptians and the Canaanites made mirrors of polished copper and of silver, metals attributed to the planet Venus and the moon. I extended my experiments to include others, and I soon discovered that it was even more effective if the magician stood behind a passive receiver who could then concentrate totally on the mirror. Under the power of the Archangel Uriel, through the Angel Mendiel, in the realm of the King Zimanar, summoned thee by Barlamensis, Alicensis, Almancia, Apollo. I am here. What do you desire of me? And so I had the secret. Like Dr. Frankenstein, I had learned how to do it. But even though I may have been as obsessed as the fictional Dr. Frankenstein, I didn't want to make his mistake. Before I opened the brass vessel and released these spirits into the world again, I wanted to fully understand the philosophical and spiritual significance of a system that had been such a closely guarded secret for so many thousands of years. I had to ask myself, was it possible that there might be slumbering demons in our past that, as the late Howard Phillips Lovecraft had suggested, might better be left unawakened? How had the beautiful goddess Astarte and her handsome consort, Prince Baal the Thunder God, been transformed into demons in the medieval forbidden books of black magic. I found the answers to these questions in the mysterious, long-lost biblical book of Enoch. In those mythical prehistoric times before the Great Flood, the Book of Enoch tells of a war in heaven in which God and his loyal host of angels, led by the archangel Michael, were arrayed against a horde of rebellious angels who had lusted after the daughters of men and had descended to earth, where they were breeding a race of giants and were teaching humans the forbidden secrets of sorcery and magic. The Book of Enoch goes on to relate that the four great archangels, Mikael, Raphael, Gabriel, and Oriel, came down and imprisoned these fallen angels at the four corners of the earth, 
where they became known as the Watchers. Jewish, Christian, and Islamic theologies retained the traditional loyal angels of heaven, 